Hello everybody, I'm Gwen Campbell Mendes. Welcome to Gwen's Bookish Ramblings. So closer to the chest, last book of the Herald Spy trilogy. Um, and this is the misogyny book. Uh, and uh, before anyone says anything, I do mean the genuine misogyny book, the We Hate Women book, not not misogyny in the in the generalization that has become slightly unfortunately popular um, because misogyny is defined as a hatred of women rather than mere sexism, which is the, you know, them women's aren't as smart as men. Um, and, and they are different things. Uh, when you, when you conflate the things, you start to make one word have no meaning and then you lose shades of meaning and it, it is a thing that bothers me. Um, but in any event, this is the misogyny book. Uh, when we start off the book, there's some very heavy-handed foreshadowing, uh, with Mags and a friend of his, uh, Teo, who is a sort of, uh, he's, he's a private-for-hire guardsman sort of person, and Mags is cultivating him to be part of his spy network, um, and they're basically sitting around in a tavern and they hear a bunch of men behind them going on and on about how women don't know their place and how if, you know, and, and how they, ex they think that women should just be bowing down at their feet and all, you know, the kinds of things that people, that men who feel hard done by by the female sex uh, ten, the, the ones who feel hard done by and don't have any genuine rational reason for it, uh, usually the ones who are hard done by because they have been jerks first, uh, that kind of palaver. The thing is, um, that, of course, because Mags is a herald and women are heralds, he's very forcibly in a position where... You know, even if he had ever believed women to be inferior, he couldn't because it would have been drummed out of his head. Um, so Mags, we get this heavy-handed foreshadowing, and throughout the whole book, you know, it's it's very, very clear that the Sethorite temple is going to be at the heart of these various attacks on women, there's a letter-writing campaign against women, uh, up on the, uh, in the collegium and at the palace. There are attacks on women shop owners. There are, um, well, not attacks. It's, uh, it's very serious vandalism and destruction of property, women shop owners, and the same thing for two temples, uh, one of which is a all-female militant temple, and the other of which is a temple of effectively women copyists that sort of what they do in that temple is is copying designs in books. Uh, you know, things like uh, technical blueprints, and uh, they copy technical blueprints for people to make copies of books. Um, and both of those places get vandalized very, very severely. And the thing is, uh, it's very heavy-handed in its approach, this one. Um, something that I find, I uh, will be frank, slightly problematic, therefore, because uh, when you're that heavy-handed um, you kind of see all of the various outcomes, you know, oncoming at the end of the book. And, you know, I, I have never said the Mercedes Lackey is the greatest author of all time. But this particular one, it feels a little more heavy-handed than, than her other books in terms of foreshadowing, in terms of where it's going. Um, I think this one falls down a little bit. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed watching Mags's relationship with Emily develop. I enjoyed watching him, you know, the both of them 
knowing enough to keep their tempers and not wind up ruining things between them because, well, yes, you know, you've got the two of them in this long-term relationship, the two of them married, the two of them living together, uh, you know, that doesn't mean that you're never going to have arguments because, you know, that's a thing. You have two people who live together, uh, they're going to argue at some point. You, you can't expect them not to. Um, and both of them are in very high stress, very high pressure jobs, uh, with a lot of responsibility and a lot of danger and so on and so on and so forth. So, you know, it's very nice to see them both be adult about it. Um, and I enjoyed watching them much more than the last book. Uh, again, like Arrows... You have the first book, which is learning to do the job, and the second book, which is getting settled into the job. This is the book where they're sort of, they're both allowed to do their job. They're still asking for advice. They're still looking to other people for recommendations. But to a ex very powerful extent, this is the two of them getting on with doing the job. Um, and at several points in this book, there are sort of these moments when the people around them, their elders, their mentors, etc., etc., wind up sort of just saying, no, you go right ahead, do your thing. Um, and that's very, very nice. Um, and it's interesting to watch the two of them scheme around stuff while trying to figure out how to how to maintain their ethics, because, of course, you have this problem that if you're going to be moral and ethical, that you you can scheme all you want, but you still have to sort of keep yourself... Uh, you have to keep yourself from flying overboard and, and, not, and not crossing that line. So, you know, there's... There's a lot in this book that I very, very much like. Um, you know, I enjoy... I enjoy the whole concept. I enjoy the conceit of Valdemar. I enjoy these books. I enjoy how Mercedes Lackey writes them. But the one thing that does trip me up is how heavy-handed the foreshadowing is. In fact, it's so heavy-handed that I actually thought that she was going to take a slightly different angle on this, that not that the S Temple of Sethor wouldn't have anything to do with it, because, of course, a temple showing up, uh, being filled with pe with men who are basically being told, yes, be angry at women for stealing your jobs and not knowing their place. Sure, it might be connected to it, but I had figured that it would sort of more be a point where a bunch of people with sort of similar ideas wound up gathering together and uh, causing trouble. Not that the head priest of the temple and his two and his lead henchmen were, you know, both absolutely at the center of and the cause of uh, all of these letters, one of which nearly drives one girl to suicide. Well, nearly drives her to suicide. She doesn't actually kill herself, but the only reason she doesn't succeed at it is because they find the letters that she had been getting and start watching her very closely and are able to catch up to her before she kills herself. Um, I don't know. I The thing is, I really, really like this book. I, I do. Uh, and I don't want to... I don't want to be that person who says, I love this book, here's everything wrong with it. Because, like I said, the only thing wrong with it is how heavy-handed the foreshadowing is. Uh, the characters are still these characters that I like. Uh, we have lost Bear and Lena, who were um, very important characters in the first uh, series in the Collegium Chronicles. Uh, but Bear and Lena have both moved on to do other things with their lives, and are basically no longer in this series. Uh, which is a bit of a pity, because it might have been nice for there to be, you know, letter writing or something. 
but it's it's nonetheless you know quite nice uh, to to see how this is going to see how these characters are changing and adjusting and becoming you know and becoming much more comfortable in who they are supposed to be. Um, I do have one problem with this cover, which is seeing these two people who I assume are supposed to be Mags and Emily, and neither of them is dressed in white. Which, in the case of Mags, doesn't really matter, because Mags is always pretending to be a not-a-herald, whether hark on the bully boy, or hark on the manservant, or... Uh, as he is in this book, Packler, the random laborer who manages to get himself suckered in by the Setherites. But Emily is basically just the king's own and is dressed as a herald all the time and should therefore be in white and not sort of a yellowy color. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a nitpick with the cover. Uh, and... Given that Jody Lee has been doing these covers all this time, I have to assume that she and Mercedes Lackey probably have something of a functional, uh, professional relationship, and probably at this point these covers get run past Mercedes Lackey precisely because I would be willing to bet that she's very much a cornerstone or a keystone of of Daw Books, one of those people who sort of holds down their sales because, you know, she remains popular after all these years. Um, and, of course, is tremendously prolific. I mean, you just you just look at how many books Mercedes Lackey has written, and uh, it's a lot of books. It really, really is. Um, anyhow, let's see. Uh, so... One of the things we do get in this is, and I expect that it's supposed to be, I mean, partly it, it may be because Mercedes Lackey is exploring this idea that she may not have really clarified in her own head until after she had written uh, the Vanielle trilogy. Um, because, of course, the Magic's Price uh, the, the Last Herald Mage trilogy, um, was written after the, after Arrows, and so there's sort of this, this thing that I, she may not have, like, sort of really settled on until that point, but, uh, we know from back in, uh, the Herald Mage trilogy that Vanielle had put a Teledra style a uh, heartstone and set one up in the palace. Um, but there are no more herald mages because there aren't any more herald mages until Queen Selene's time, which is like literally something like a thousand five hundred, hundreds and hundreds of years after after Vanielle that you finally start getting mages reappearing in Valdemar or rather, native herald mages, so to speak. Um, and so you have the spell that's designed to make everybody forget about magic, but Mags and Emily are sitting there in that room where they're allowed to talk about magic in the room with the heartstone because there's sort of a, a you know hole or a break in the spell there. And it's really, really interesting... Um, this sort of exploration about the ins and outs of that spell. It's a neat little bit of world building that there's this bit in the spell that allows heralds to to figure out about magic and to know about it in case they have to deal with it coming in from outside. Um, I, I think she anthropomorphizes the stone a little bit more in this as compared to how it was uh, the first time we hear about it in the Collegium Chronicles, but that may just be because Mags has more practice. And I'm basically out of time on this, so that's it for the Herald Spy Trilogy, and we'll be moving on to something else next week.